welcome all of you to the, or welcome back, I should say, to the uh, O Oregon Department of Energy's Hanford webinar series. Tonight is the fourth presentation in a series of five we're doing about the Hanford site. The first three weeks we talked first about an overview of history and issues of Hanford and some of the challenges with cleanup. Second week was about tanks and tank waste. Last week was groundwater issues on the site, and tonight we want to talk about natural um, resource issues, management of resources, uh, restoration at Hanford, and so talk, talk some about the Hanford Natural Resource Trustee Council. Uh, next week, the final presentation, we'll look at transportation, um, issues related to material, pretty much waste coming and going from Hanford, particularly coming and going through Oregon on its way to or from Hanford. So with that, we'll get started and get going here. Uh, let me introduce myself briefly. My name is Paul Schaefer. Uh, I'm an ecologist with the Oregon Department of Energy's Nuclear Safety and Environmental Emergency Planning Division. Um, I've had training in ecology and in biogeochemical cycling in terrestrial and aquatic systems. I've worked with ODO for about seven and a half years on Hanford issues, focusing primarily on natural resources. I'm also Oregon's representative to the Hanford Natural Resource Trustee Council. We'll talk more about that later. And then in addition to my Hanford work, I have about 30 years of professional experience in environmental research and assessment on a whole variety of topics ranging from acid rain to wetlands to community fire risk assessment. So for tonight's topic, um, I want to start by just briefly recapitulating the, the current condition of Hanford, what's happened, um, what the site's about right now, how did we get there. I want to talk briefly about plans for the future of the site, and then I want to get more specifically into, re into issues that are being addressed under the Natural Resource Damage Assessment provisions of the Superfund Law, or CERCLA. Um, I also want to note that, as usual, at the end of my presentation, we'll have some time set aside for questions and answers. If you've got questions as we go along, um, please feel free to submit them early. Um, if you have something that's a burning question that, that you don't understand and needs to be answered, we'll try to respond, but we may not get to that till the end. So um, I encourage you to, to be participatory here. So as we get started, um, before we get going, I want to just start with poll question number one. When you think about the environment at Hanford, what do you envision is there? And so you've got a couple alternatives here. Um, tell me what you think. Okay, um, we, we got somebody, at least one person answered each of these options. Um, and let me just real quickly uh, note that the, the correct answer here is such as number three. Um, some parts of the site are pretty grossly disturbed, and we've sort of focused on those in earlier presentations, so not a real fair question. Um, as we go along here, what you'll see is that, that there's a lot of Hanford that's really pretty minimally disturbed, and there's some really very high-quality ecosystem there. So with that, we'll move ahead. And just to orient us, uh, start with the site map. The slide you've seen, I think, before um, lays out the Hanford site, 586 square miles in south-central Washington, about 40 miles north of the Oregon border, a uh, series of, of production nuclear reactors along the Columbia River in the area referred to as the 100 area. In the southeast corner of the site, the 300 area, which was an area for research and fuel fabrication. And then in the central plateau, the 200 area, which is where the um, separation facilities, the, the uh, canyons, were located. It's also where the tank farms that hold high-level waste are located. One of the things this map doesn't show very clearly, but that's important to the Hanford ecosystem, 
is that the Columbia River flowing through Hanford um, is free flowing. The, the tailwaters from McNary Dam um, end right about at the 300 area. So from there upstream, the reach is free flowing. It's the longest undammed segment of the Columbia River above the estuary in the United States. Looking at this just a little bit differently, this is a map of the Columbia River Basin. And if you follow the, the main stem of the Columbia River upstream, uh, there are 11 dams on the main stem in the Columbia River in the United States, four below Hanford and seven above. So it sort of emphasizes that because fish need that flowing water to, salmon at least, need that flowing water to spawn, sort of by default it makes the Hanford Reach a pretty important place. And so because what, what was once common, which was, Free-flowing water, fast flow, well-oxygenated water is now pretty rare in the, in the main stem Columbia River. Another slightly different view of Hanford from what you've seen before um, is a map here of the western United States. The shaded areas, and the gray doesn't show up real well on, on this one screen, um, the shaded areas show areas that have sagebrush growing in them, which pretty much is the whole Intermountain West. Um, the red circle is approximately where the Hanford site is located, and the, the green areas are areas where sagebrush is the dominant vegetation on the landscape. These are all semi-arid areas, um, about 10 inches, a little more, a little less of precip a year, not enough water to support trees, so sagebrush and some other species like bitterbrush and, and rabbit brush are the dominant plants. Also in some places there's there's grassland, um, and the areas that are high amounts of sagebrush now, high cover of sagebrush, are that way mostly because some of these other areas used to have heavy, dense cover of sagebrush, and it's been lost primarily to agriculture and, and grazing pressure. Here's a, an image of a fairly typical sagebrush ecosystem, um, broken cover, um, the large, large plants, some of these big sagebrush plants will be 8, even 10 to 15 feet high, but it's not a continuous cover on the land, and they're interspersed with grasses or bare ground. And so that's, that's what much of this looks like. So that's, that's kind of Hanford first look in a nutshell. Okay, that's the site. Um, before we get on to talking about natural resources, I want to just take a moment and go back and talk through some of the recent uh, impacts that there have been on the Hanford site and lead from there into why active resource management is such an important concern on the site. This little guy on the slide, by the way, is a burrowing owl. As the name implies, they um, live in burrows in the ground. They're a resident in sagebrush habitats, including Hanford and they happen to be a species that's in decline across the West, mostly due to habitat loss. Okay, what went on at Hanford, good and bad? Um, as you remember from some of the earlier presentations, it was the world's first plutonium production facility. Uh, started with the B reactor that you see in the upper right there. Work began on that in 1943. It began production in 1944. And through the next few decades, ran to a total of nine reactors and five separation facilities, these canyons, um, on the Hanford site. And plutonium production went from 1944 until 1988. It was the world's first plutonium production facility. In addition, uh, as a byproduct of all that um, chemical work that was going on, there were massive quantities of waste produced, both radioactive and chemical, and much of that was released into the environment. About 440 billion gallons of liquid waste went to ponds, trenches, and cribs on the site, and in addition, millions of pounds of solid waste, as you see some examples on the left, uh, were packaged often in boxes or barrels and went to burial grounds and trenches and there are literally thousands of, of waste sites um, at Hanford, some of which have been cleaned up, some have yet to, to really be touched as part of the cleanup operations. 
In addition, there's about 55 million gallons of high-level waste um, in underground tanks, 177 total underground tanks in the Central Plateau, and a little over a third of those known or suspected leakers that have released more than a million gallons of waste into the environment. Some of that's gone to groundwater. Dirk Dunning two weeks ago, Dale Engstrom last week talked about that. And in addition, um, Dale talked quite a bit about groundwater issues, uh, both from tank leaks in the plateau where you see here and from, from a variety of the other releases of liquids to Hanford. Uh, there's been movement of a variety of chemicals, both um, hazardous chemicals and radioisotopes into groundwater. This map shows plumes just in the central plateau. And as you can see, a wide range of chemicals and isotopes um, that, that have reached groundwater. If you look at the entire site, <coughs> excuse me, um, this, the, the shaded areas on this map show groundwater with contaminant concentrations that are higher than a legal standard. Typically, that means higher than a drinking water standard. Um, for at least one contaminant and covers about 90 square miles of the Hanford site. In his presentation, Dale talked about a variety of treatment systems that are being used to try to control and, and remove contaminants from groundwater. Some have been quite successful. Some have not worked very well. And some of them are pretty new, and we really don't know yet how well they're going to work. So it's pretty obvious. Um, Hanford's been responsible for some major insults to the environment in, in South Central Washington. It's been described as the most contaminated site in North America. It's a very daunting uh, set of ways to try to clean up and, and, and to restore the site. But I think it's only fair to note that the effects of Hanford have not been all negative. Um, activities and management of the site, primarily restricted access by the public, restricted land uses, um, done originally for security during the era of plutonium production, more recently to prevent um, exposure of the public to Hanford contaminants, has protected a lot of the land on the site. The result is that Hanford has some of the highest quality habitats in the Northwest, and this is beneficial in a couple of ways. If you remember the map I showed you with um, where there was sagebrush habitat, this is a map produced by the state of Washington looking only at Washington. All of the shaded area is, is land that it, at some time was dominated by sagebrush. Um, the blue areas, which is most of that, um, have lost most or all of the sagebrush, primarily by conversion to agricultural land. Uh, the yellow and brownish or tan areas um, are areas where the cover is still relatively intact. And as you can see, the area inside the, the red circle there where the Hanford site is located is one of the, the large area, the few large areas that's, that's relatively intact and has been pretty well protected. The other area that goes close by that's also relatively intact in here is another um, area that's had restricted access. It's the Yakima Proving Ground, which is a, a Department of Defense uh, for training facility. The, the, the bottom line is that Hanford and this Yakima Proving Ground are now regarded as the most, as the largest piece of intact sagebrush step habitat in the Northwest. I do want to point out that I said DO actions, DOE's actions have mostly protected habitat. Um, unfortunately, Hanford's had several range fires, a couple of them very, very large in the last 20 years that have burned, or in a few cases reburned, um, almost half of the site. So while the site has still natural vegetation, it's, some of it is very young, very immature in terms of, of uh, what kind of condition the, the sagebrush habitat's in. So by this habitat being protected, it means not just that we're protecting this sagebrush, but we're also protecting the critters that live on that sagebrush. Um, and, and these are a few examples of, of what you see on and around the Hanford site. Um, ferruginous hawks, sage sparrows, mule deer, and elk also. Um, burrowing owl, our little friend again, 
pygmy rabbit. Uh, these are all species that, that are native to Hanford. Um, many of them are in decline, um, partly on, not so much on the site, but around it, again, because of mostly of habitat loss. The other picture that's on here at the bottom is the sage grouse. Um, this is a, a species that's actually never been very common on Hanford, even though it's one of the iconic species in sagebrush systems. Um, I included it because one of the restoration goals for the state of Washington is to establish a breeding population of sage grouse on the Hanford site at some time in the future. And just like the terrestrial habitat's been re been protected by land use restrictions. Um, much of the Columbia River has been protected. Access has been limited. Constructs, possible construction of a dam partway along the Hanford Reach was prevented um, because of Hanford operations. And again, this has not just protected the river. It's also protected the species that live in the river. And there's some examples here, Chinook salmon, steelhead trout, white sturgeon, and Pacific lamprey. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, salmon require flowing water and coarse sediments to spawn successfully. And so, again, by default, because it's the, the only large free-flowing reach, Hanford's now the, the most important spawning habitat in the Columbia River system in the United States, more than 10,000 reds in a typical year. I also included the lamprey, which a lot of you have probably never heard of. Some of you probably think it's kind of unattractive. I'd agree. Um, but it's an important species culturally for the Native American tribes, particularly the Nez Perce. It's important for ceremonial purposes. It's important uh, historically as a food also. Um, and it's a species that's in very severe decline in the Mid-Columbia Basin. Uh, that decline is believed to be predominantly due to construction of dams and other facilities along the river. The potential effects of contaminants from Hanford or anywhere else on the, uh, the lamprey are, are frankly completely unknown. There's been literally no research on that that, that we're aware of. So the legacy of Hanford um, on the site has been both good and bad. Um, you, you, we, we focus often on the bad, but I think it was important to say that it's also had some good effects. I want to turn now to what's been going on since the Hanford mission changed a little over 20 years ago from plutonium production to cleanup. In 1989, the transition started with the signing of a, of a legal consent decree that's commonly known as the Tri-Party. Uh, it was signed by Department of Energy, US EPA, and the Washington Department of Ecology. Um, that's why, obviously, tri-parties. And that officially converted the mission of Hanford from production to cleanup. When the TPA was set up, it established a framework and a process for cleanup and cleanup planning and decisions. And at that time, it was envisioned that it would take about 30 years to clean the site. Unfortunately, that schedule was optimistic, and obviously we, we are not going to meet that. Uh, so moving ahead to what has happened since 1989, I want to look at three areas with you. The first is cleanup or response operations under CERCLA. Uh, and just as a reminder, I think CERCLA is on the list of definitions that was sent to you in acronyms yesterday. It is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. Uh, most of us know it either as CERCLA or more commonly as Superfund. And that's, that's a law that was passed by the Congress, went into effect at the end of 1980, um, that provides some guidance on um, cleaning up hazardous waste sites and establishing liability so that the people who were the polluters are where possible, made responsible for paying to clean it up. So I want to talk about response actions or cleanup actions. I want to talk a little bit about land use plans and land use management as it's currently practiced on the site. And then I want to turn to the, so the NRDA, or NERDA as we call it, which is Natural Resource Damage Assessment, which is a process also part of Superfund 
that's just really getting going on the Hanford site. So what's happened it's since 1989 in Hanford, as Ken Niles talked about three weeks ago, there has been a lot of cleanup on the site in the past 15 years. Hundreds of buildings have been torn down. Most of the reactors have been cocooned. Uh, as you see in the upper right here, that means the, the supporting buildings have been mostly taken down and the reactor buildings have been closed up, uh, new roofs put on them, sealed up, and um, closed up for a period that's planned to be about 70 years to allow a lot of the radiation to uh, radioactive material to decay inside the reactors so these buildings can then be cleaned up and, and taken down. In addition, hundreds of waste sites have been cleaned up at reactor areas. Um, and more than 10 million tons of contaminated soil and building materials have been taken down, removed, taken to Central Hanford to a, a large landfill called the Environmental uh, Restoration Disposal Facility. It's a huge lined landfill to give you some perspective. It's about 1,000 feet wide. Where'd my cursor go? There it is. Across this, um, and it's now something on the order of a mile long. More than 10 million tons of waste and contaminated soil have been taken there so far. And just to give you a sense of scale of what that 10 million cubic yards means, if you put that on a football field and started piling it up, that pile would be about a mile high right now. So gives you the idea of just how much work has been done to get rid of waste at Hanford. And in addition to, to taking down buildings, cleaning up waste sites, um, as was talked about last week, several treatments for groundwater have, have been put into place and are online. Um, those are operating. Um, those are a long-term proposition to, to, to complete their jobs. And while much has been done, work is ongoing and there is still much to do. The, the strategy that's being implemented at Hanford is to start with the river corridor. Um, it's the area along the river and to complete most of the cleanup there in the next three to five years. The target was 2015. DOE had a document called the 2015 Vision, um, which, which was to finish the river by then. And they, the, the decision was made by DOE to start along the river for a couple of reasons. First of all, it got a lot of, of waste that was very close to the Columbia River cleaned up and gone, so contamination of the river from those sources either wouldn't happen or where it was already ongoing, it would end. Um, it was also sites that were relatively straightforward to, to figure out what was there and clean up, and it had some visibility to the public. Um, so. Most of us think that was a pretty good strategy to start there. And then when that nears completion, to start moving to what's referred to as the outer area of the central plateau. I'll show you a map with this in just a moment. And then finally, finish cleanup of the, the what's called the inner area of the central plateau, the 200 area, um, and the area around the tanks, sometime about 2050 after completing processing tank waste. Uh, one of the things that I think is important to note is that not all waste will be cleaned up at Hanford um, for a variety of reasons. In some cases, it was believed that that material was, was not mobile um, or, or would not be mobile in the future, so it was okay to cover it with soil and leave it in place that it wasn't going to move. In some cases, the decisions were based um, in part or largely on cost as a major factor that it's simply very to, you know, a lot of work or sometimes not a whole lot of contamination, so it's hard to get it cleaned up and it's tough to justify the money. Uh, and in some cases, like tritium in groundwater, there simply is no technical capability for doing that. So you don't have a lot of choice but to simply leave it and let it either flow to the river and be diluted or decay away. There's also, as I've suggested, talking about the ERDF, this Environmental Restoration Disposal Facility, there are places where waste was, is being deliberately um, returned, dug up from one place, returned to the environment. And, and that's 
may sound kind of crazy to dig it up here and put it back in the ground there, but the fact is it's going into a lined landfill. Uh, it's being monitored. There's a known inventory, and there's known waste form. So it's, it's much better than simply leaving things in place and, and not even knowing what's there. This map shows a little bit of this idea of cleaning up first these green areas um, close to the river. A lot of this area away from where the reactors were and away from the 300 area um, is being included in the, in the decisions and the, and the work packages to close these areas along the river. Much of this area was pretty minimally disturbed and there's not much contamination in it. When that area is done, then the brown area here, what we call the outer area of the central plateau will be cleaned. And then finally, this yellow area in the center, the inner zone of the central plateau will be mostly or entirely um, permanently dedicated to waste management because of residual materials in the, in the ground, including, if I can get my cursor worker, including earth of this giant landfill that sits here. In addition, there's an area around the perimeter of the site uh, called the Hanford Reach National Monument. Um, and I'm going to jump to the next slide and talk a little bit more about that. Oops, no, I'm not. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the cleanup. What happened to my map? Hmm. Excuse me one second here. I lost my place. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay, um, I'll, I'll talk in a minute about the Hanford Reach National Monument. I got ahead of myself there. Um, when cleanup is being planned and done at all these waste sites along the river and, and in the, the outer areas, th there's a systematic process that goes into that. Um, it's being done it, according to the process that's outlined in, in CERCLA, the Superfund Law again. Um, it starts by doing what's called a remedial investigation and feasibility study. That's a fancy name for saying, let's understand what's in the environment here. What do we know about the nature and the amount of waste in the remedial investigation? And then the second part of that is, is what's feasible? What are the alternatives for cleaning it up? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of each? Once that information's known, uh, the Department of Energy will put together what's called a proposed plan. And as the name suggests, that's their intended path forward. That's what they intend to do to resolve the, the waste issues in those areas to, to reduce risk, either by removing waste from the ground or isolating them where they won't be mobile. Um, at that point, the regulators, um, EPA, have to approve of that. Uh, proposed plan. They write what's called a record of decision, which is the formal document that says, here's what's going to be done, and, and here's the time frame in which it will happen. And then those cleanup actions are implemented. And that process happens um, roughly according to that approach over and over and over again at Hanford as, as these individual waste sites or groups of waste sites have been cleaned up. Uh, I should also note that, that throughout this process, there is review, an opportunity for review by stakeholders, particularly back at this initial um, remedial investigation phase. But it's important to recognize that the decisions are ultimately being made by DOE and the regulators. OK. Um, let's let's uh, get ready to jump a little bit ahead here. That's what's happening with cleanup. But once cleanup is over, are we done? What happens? Um, how's the land managed? And so on. So I want to go to poll question number two, um, which is what happens after cleanup's completed? What's going to be done with the site? And I should say this question has had a huge amount of discussion for the last two decades. There is not, probably never will be, complete consensus on what ought to be done. Uh, 
but just to let you think a little bit about the alternatives, go ahead and, and uh, answer the, this. There's five possibilities for you here. Okay, I think Becky is closing the poll, so you've got just one last opportunity to log your answer. Um, most of you selected the fourth option, which is to preserve the site um, as habitat for native species uh, and permit some, rec some level of recreational use. About two-thirds of you chose that. Uh, mercifully, nobody chose nothing, believing that the site's too contaminated. Um, and nobody was in favor of developing the entire site for industrial or residential use. Um, I, I should mention that almost all of those alternatives have been seriously proposed at some point or another. The reality is that option, I believe it is three, which is mixed use, um, is the, the alternative that was selected by DOE about 15 years ago. This map shows you their what's called their comprehensive land use plan, which was their preferred alternative from an environmental impact statement. And this is the plan under which they're currently managing the site. Uh, this came after a lot of discussion and review with a lot of input from all sorts of stakeholders. Um, the the adopted plan attempts to, to manage several possible land uses. Ignore the red circle on this. Um, this was a, a simply was the, the cleanest copy of this map I was able to get my hands on when I was putting this presentation together. And it happened to be from somebody who was emphasizing these industrial and, and research land uses down in the southeast corner of the site. So you probably can't read the fine print at the bottom. So let me just very quickly White is areas that are set aside um, for industrial, commercial development. There's two main areas for that. The southeast corner of the site, close to the city of Richland, um, and that's an area where infrastructure is already in place, and it would minimize the amount of development for, for transportation and utilities, for instance. The other large area is the central plateau. Uh, that's, that's slated for industrial development. Uh, those areas are already being used for that, and mostly that area is intended for, for um, waste management in the future and some compatible uses. Blue is an area set aside for research. Um, the yellow and orange, which are some pretty small areas, mostly up here along the river. I think there's one over or two over here at the north end of the site. Uh, those are areas designated for recreational use. Mostly that's access to the Columbia River plan there. The light green area in the, that covers most of the center of the site is set aside for what's called conservation and mining. Uh, those sound a bit inconsistent as uses that go together. What it really means is that most of that land will be conserved and, and managed for um, habitat values. But DOE reserves the right to um, excavate selected areas of that to get soil for backfilling waste sites and, and putting caps over some of the waste sites that won't be completely dug up. The dark green land uh, covers about a little over half the site. There's a couple of specific sites that are being managed. Um, these are being managed for um, protection, essentially no development. Uh, no disturbance. And there's two or three areas I want to mention here. Gable Butte and Gable Mountain that run across the north part of the site. Um, these are areas that have not been disturbed. They are, are sacred to essentially all of the Native American tribes in the area. The third area uh, that goes along with that is in here. It's an area of, of large sand dunes um, that were developed during the Missoula floods, and those are being protected. And then the, the, what was really established as a buffer area uh, for security reasons during Hanford operations 
is this area around the perimeter of the site, uh, covers about 300 square miles, and that has been turned over, or management of that area has been turned over to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, and incorporated as the Hanford Reach National Monument. So now I'm going to what I thought I was going to five minutes ago. This area was established by the Clinton administration by an executive order in 2000. Um, this land was to be managed in part, this area north of the river, as part of the National Wildlife Refuge System. And this area along the southwest side of Hanford is something called the Fitzner Eberhard Arid Lands Ecology Preserve. That's an area set aside for research. Um, and it's maintained with, with very limited public access so that it won't disturb uh, the habitat or the, the critters that live there. The executive order that set this up um, also directed the Department of Energy to manage the balance of Hanford, these areas in kind of yellow and, and browns in here, um, in a way that would could support their eventual incorporation into the same national monument. So there was, and I think in some minds, continues to be an expectation that eventually this land will all, with the exceptions of those areas zoned for development or actually developed, uh, will become part of the, the Hanford Reach National Monument and go into the wildlife refuge system. OK. Um, Looking ahead, what, what needs to happen? Um, we're kind of caught up to now on cleanup. We're talking, we've talked a little bit about current land use management of the site. What happens in the future and what needs to happen? Um, as DOE develops and implements plans for cleanup, once those plans are in place, once the work's been done, if results are monitored, is there anything else that needs to happen? Um, what needs to be done to ensure the long-term integrity of the site? And that brings us to poll question number three, um, which is a bit of a rhetorical question. It's setting up the rest of my presentation. And, and it asked, why are injury assessment and restoration important at Hanford? So please take a minute, look at these answers, and, and uh, give it your best shot. Okay, um, got just a couple of seconds, um, and I think most of you got this right in part, if not right completely. The correct answer is all of the above. There's, there's several reasons why additional um, assessment work and restoration are, are important at Hanford. Um, and the, the question, why is additional work important, is a little vague there. I'm sorry. I, I switched that, but that didn't get to Becky in time for her to put it into the questions as they came to you. But the point is, there's a lot of reasons um, that, that additional work, additional characterization, and perhaps additional cleanups necessary at Hanford. So um, let's, let's jump into this and, and talk through what this is. So we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about this thing I mentioned earlier, Natural Resource Damage Assessment, or NERDA. What is it? Why is it important? Um, and I'll just tell you that, that I'm a little biased in talking about this because this is what I spend most of my time on. So um, this is something I, I care pretty deeply about. I'm also going to tell you that I don't have a lot of ways of putting the next few minutes worth of presentation in, in pictures. So it's going to be mostly text slides. So bear with me on that. Um, as the slide says, NERDA is just the acronym for Natural Resource Damage Assessment. It's a process that's defined and is part of CERCLA. Um, the, the purpose of NERDA is to protect the public interest on these sites and, and protect the natural resources. And as the, the slide says, to make the public whole. 
And what that really means is to ensure that natural resource injuries are ended and there is restoration of the site to restore or replace those services that were damaged or lost as part of release of hazardous substances. And just real quickly, hazardous substances can be a lot of things, as the name suggests, acids, metals, solvents, other organic chemicals, radioactive materials, um, any, in, any number of things singly or in combination represent hazardous substances under, under CERCLA. Now, to understand why NERDA is important, let me just take this next slide here. I put together three images, and they're, they're not the same place, so, so don't take them quite literally. But if you start on the left, what you see is a piece of, of pretty high quality habitat, undisturbed, nothing done to it. The center slide, waste disposals going on, hazardous materials are being released into the environment. And the third slide here um, shows an area partway through um, cleanup. Some of the sites have been backfilled and graded. Some of these are still holes in the ground waiting to have soil backfill put into them. But in any case, when you look at this, obviously by digging up stuff and, and filling up the holes, you have not restored this site to anything like its historic condition. So there's still important work to do, and that's what NERDA does. Uh, there is a fundamental difference and, and, a, and a dual function within CERCLA. Response actions or cleanup are intended to contain or remove the contaminants to stop them from, from causing um, problems in the environment. Cleanup is not meant to restore the site, and that's what NERDA does. So moving ahead, we'll, we'll hit you with a few more definitions here. I'm talking about natural resources. What's that mean? Well, the answer from CERCLA is pretty broad. Land, water, biota, air, groundwater, drinking water, or other such resources. And those other resources, case law in the time since CERCLA was enacted, that includes soil, it includes uh, geologic materials. So pretty much any naturally occurring material in the environment. Um, there's a second part of this um, definition um, that it talks about resources belonging to, managed by, et cetera, the government. And in most cases, uh, natural resources are under state law or federal um, public resources. They're publicly owned or managed. And the whole notion of a trust relationship and of trust trustees means that, that the governments that are involved as trustees in, in this NERDA thing um, have a trust responsibility to take care of and manage, and in this case, restore those natural resources for the public. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that I serve as, as Oregon's representative on the Hanford Natural Resource Trustee Council. And, and when I'm doing that job, I'm not simply Paul Schaefer. I'm there representing the state of Oregon, and really more importantly, I'm representing the interests of all the citizens of Oregon. So um, we, we are entrusted with that. It's a, it's a, um, it's a kind of, a, of an important thing we do. Okay. I've mentioned a couple of words, um, injury and damage. What do those mean? Um, so there's a couple of more definitions here. An injury really means two things. First of all, it's a change in the resource. It is a measurable and adverse change in a chemical or physical quality of one of those resources, or it's a change in the viability of, of biota, um, if we're talking about biota as a natural resource. In addition, injury is also an impairment in, in what we talk about and call the services that are provided by a resource. Um, what that means is, if it, to give you an example, if you have a river that has a chemical spill, let's say, and there's a fish die off and the, and the water and, and sediments are contaminated, that water, those sediments, and those biota 
have been injured. Um, those resources are injured. The inability of people to use that water for recreational purposes, for subsistence fishing, for ceremonial purposes is a service loss. It's a lost use of the resource. Um, likewise, if groundwater is contaminated, that's an injury to groundwater. The fact that people can't use that contaminated water for drinking or irrigation is a, is a lost service. And those services also need to be restored or replaced under CERCLA. Um, injury is measured relative to something we call the baseline condition. And that's the condition that would have existed had a release of hazardous substances not occurred. Um, and in the case of a place like Hanford, where some of the release happened a long time ago, um, because materials are still bleeding from the soils into groundwater and into the river, that release is ongoing under the law. Um, so you have to measure against what you think the change or what the condition would have been had none of that happened. There's another term here that that's part of NERD itself, which is damage. Um, injury is the effect on the resource. Damage is what we talk about as the monetized value of that injured resource. And that's a fancy way of saying it's the cost of either restoring or replacing the injured resources and the services that they're providing. So how did NERDA happen? What goes on? Okay. Um, I mentioned trustees a few minutes ago. And NERDA is carried out by people who are natural resource trustees, we're the people who are responsible for planning and implementing NERDA at a particular Superfund site. And the trust organizations are identified by CERCLA. It can be states, it can be Native American tribes, or it can be federal agencies. Um, and in addition to be a trustee for a particular place like Hanford, you have to have a connection to resources at, at that particular site. So for instance, the state of Kansas, just to pick one, is not going to be a trustee at Hanford. Oregon's a trustee because um, even though the Hanford site obviously is in Washington, um, Oregon has, has interests in water quality in the river, which can be affected by releases of Hanford. We also have issues with anadromous fish and migratory birds. Uh, so those are things that give us a connection to the Hanford site and that establish our, our authority as a trustee of that site. The trustees can act individually um, or they can act collectively, which is the more typical thing they do. Uh, trustees will form what's called a trustee council that acts collectively in making decisions about um, evaluating injuries and, and planning and carrying out restoration on a site. NRDA is a legal process between trustees and what's called the responsible party. Um, it's a pretty self-explanatory term. It means the people who um, either made the mess or the people who are responsible for the mess. If, for instance, they bought the land after it was already contaminated, they would become the responsible party. At Hanford, um, the responsible party is the United States. DOE manages the site, but the U.S. government actually is the owner, official owner. And ultimately, the U.S. Department of Justice will represent the United States. Uh, you can look at that as them or as us in this process as it moves forward. Um, the steps in, in this NERDA process are not unlike what happens in making cleanup decisions. Um, the trustees are responsible for preparing an injury assessment plan to look at um, what don't we know about, what do we and don't we know about injury, possible injury on the site. Um, and then if necessary, either through evaluation of existing data or by doing studies um, in the environment, those might be as simple as going out and collecting water or soil data. It might be as complex as doing some basic um, ecotoxicological research to understand 
um, that how how a particular animal or, or plant species responds to some particular contaminant or combination of contaminants. Uh, so you, you characterize the occurrence and the extent of injuries to natural resources, and then based on the magnitude of those injuries, plan and carry out restoration to, to compensate for them, to replace them, or to fix, to, to restore the injured work. Um, One of the things in this process about doing the, the damage assessment, um, when CERCLA was written, it was envisioned that this would be sequential. Somebody would clean up the site, and then somebody would come in and say, okay, now what do we have to do to restore the, the environment? More recently, and particularly in big, complex sites like Hanford, um, it, it's been recognized that you really ought to do the two of them together. Um, collect the data that you need to, to collect to know about where and how much contaminants are in the environment, what the risk is to plants and animals and humans, um, how extensive the injury, the actual injury is to natural resources. And you can do that with one set of work instead of two. Unfortunately, at least for the River Corridor at Hanford, most of that work, the characterization work for cleanup has already been done or is nearly done, so we will end up doing it sequentially. Um, at Hanford, we have eight natural resource trustees, two states, Oregon and Washington, three federal agencies, U.S. Department of Energy. They wear multiple hats at Hanford. They are the manager of the site. Um, they are the um, primary um, group that's responsible for oversight of the injury assessment, and obviously they are also a trustee because they are the site manager. Fig U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA are also trustees, and then three tribes who historically um, used the lands at Hanford, the Nez Perce, the Yakima Nation, and the, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, um, or the CTUIR, as, as they're commonly referred to. We act as a trustee council formed in 1993, and we make all of our decisions by consensus, which makes it, because we have very diverse people included on this, it makes it sometimes kind of tough to make decisions. A little bit of history, in 2007, the trustees prepared something called a pre-assessment screen, um, which is a, a quick look at existing data to decide if it's worth going ahead and doing this full NERD or whether the, the amount of contaminants released or the effects are so small that it's probably not worth doing. It, it's kind of like a preliminary hearing in the, in the legal system for, for a criminal where you kind of look and say, do we think there's enough to go forward, or, or should we just forget about this? Um, at Hanford, there was abundant evidence of releases and abundant indications that there was damage to natural resources or likely damage to natural resources. So in 2009, the trustees began preparing an injury assessment plan. We'll complete that plan in December of this year. Um, also this year, we started a couple of injury assessment studies. Um, the duration of this assessment process is uncertain uh, because it, it depends on a lot of things. What we find as we go along, um, money funding is, is always an issue for us. Um, and so we, we hope to complete that in about 10 years. And restoration will take longer because we can't start it until, obviously, until cleanup is completed for various parts of the site. The big nerd issues at Hanford, it's a huge site. It's a very complex site. And so quantifying injury is going to be difficult and it's going to be expensive. As, as you're aware, the site covers hundreds of square miles. There's a couple thousand waste sites. There's dozens of contaminants that we need to think about. Most of those will probably turn out not to be a big deal for us, but we're not sure which ones we need to worry about and which we don't. As I mentioned a moment ago, funding is limited for this work, so it will uh, move more slowly than we'd like it to. Um, 
One of the concerns we have is that there's a lack of consensus among the trustees about what we call an injury threshold. And what that means is the concentration at, of contaminants in, say, soil or water that are high enough that they cause adverse effects to um, plants and animals, and, and also how they affect people's use of the site. I'll touch on that a bit more in just a second. And then, um, obviously, we're not sure about how complete cleanup will be at a lot of the waste sites. We're not sure about success of some of the remedies that are being implemented, for instance, some of the pump and treat system, um, some sites that will, that will have a, a cap or an earthen cover put over the site with the idea of, of preventing water from moving down into the deep soils and therefore preventing movement of contaminants. And until we know that, the trustees either need to make some assumptions or guesses about how well the remedy will work, or we will have to wait and, and see. Um, when we turn to restoration at Hanford, there's a number of challenges for trustees there also. Uh, the recovery of some of these species, sagebrush in particular, is slow. Um, several decades at minimum, uh, once these are planted until there's a mature, fully functioning ecosystem. Another complicating factor with vegetation is invasive plants, particularly cheatgrass. It makes it harder to get native plants reintroduced and established. Cheatgrass also is important because it um, promotes fire on the system. Again, limited funding will limit the rate at which restoration goes forward. Um, as I mentioned before, there's some competing land use goals so that things the trustees might like to see preserved or restored might in some locations be used for industrial development that will, will limit our options. Uh, we don't always have, just as we don't always agree on thresholds for, for injury, we don't always agree on what the restoration goals ought to be. And it's partly within the trustee council, it's partly with the, the larger Hanford community. And, and another issue um, is that there's a complex, not well understood and not legally well defined relationship between NERDA and tribal treaty rights. The three tribes I mentioned that, that traditionally used Hanford um, all signed treaties with the United States government in 1855 that ceded much of the site to the government um, but at the same time, it gave each of the tribes certain rights to hunt and fish and use the land for a variety of purposes. Um, and so some of those rights get entangled with decisions about what to do and how to do with cleanup and, and NRDA. One of the big issues with tribes is a lot of the cultural losses for the tribes are what we call place-based. Um, and what that means is if a site that's important to the tribe for, for, um, for whatever reason is, is damaged or destroyed or you're not allowed to have access to it, you can't simply take a piece of land someplace else and say, here, this replaces it. Um, it would be sort of like the being Christian or Jewish, I suppose, and being told Jerusalem is off limits forever. You cannot, can't go back there to, to practice those, those things that are fundamental to you. Um, similarly, cleanup levels, um, how, how much you need to clean up contaminants. Um, in the case, partly to get past this place-based losses, some of the tribes are arguing that the only way to get around that is to completely clean up all of the contaminants at a site. And that would require very, very extensive additional cleanup. Um, it's not clear there's, there's enthusiasm by everybody for that or that there's money to, to get it done. But again, contamination degrades a site and degrades the, the, particularly the cultural practices for the tribes. Or in some cases, even if they're told the contamination levels are low, it's safe, they might be reluctant to um, 
go on a site or use plants or animals that come off of it. Um, and then finally, parts of the Hanford site are sacred. They're very central to some of the tribal beliefs and practices. And so protection of those areas is very important to tribes, um, inconsistent with current land use plans as practiced by DOE. So NERDA might get caught up in the middle of, of those decisions. There's a lot of ongoing decision and discussion, or a lot of un ongoing discussion on that, and I'm not clear when or how we'll resolve that. So, wow, in a little less than an hour here, you've sort of had a crash course in cleanup and NERDA and trusteeship, huge amount of information to digest. I kind of apologize for, for putting so much on you. Um, I'll be back in a minute to, to take questions that you might have, but in just a moment here I want to turn the, the microphone over to Becky Rubenstruck, um, who organized this program, and she wants to talk a little bit about public involvement. But before I do that, I want to just share a couple of thoughts here. Um, one of the questions with this webinar series, one of the things we hope to get out of that is to, to stimulate some, some interest and enthusiasm from those of you who are participating in Hanford activities or in similar um, involvement with similar problems and, and issues at other locations. You're already doing the most important part of that, which is being involved, getting educated on the issues, being interested. And, I, and we thank you very much for that. Um, for those of you who are not yet on a solid career path, um, I want to encourage you to think about relevant careers that, that can help resolve problems at places like Hanford. That might be technical, you know, training in ecology or chemistry or hydrology or engineering, but it might also be public pol things that touch on public policy because these are technical, technically based decisions, but they are ultimately policy decisions that are made by the public and, and by the politicians. And so being part of that decision process is important. Um, one of the things I kind of worry sometimes about when I look at our Hanford technical staff, um, you, you've seen pictures of Dirk Dunning and Dale Engstrom and me, um, and similarly the people on, some of the people on Hanford Natural Resource Trustee Council. Now Hanford's not gonna go away anytime soon but some of us will. We're getting close to retirement in the next five or ten years, and we're going to need competent, interested people to replace us. So uh, if you're not already thinking along those lines, I, I want to just encourage you to consider um, career choices that would, would help you be more effectively engaged as a professional. And if not as a professional, at least to know enough to be an informed lay person to, to be part of the conversation. So with that, I'm going to stop. I'm going to turn the microphone over to Becky, who's going to talk for a few minutes about public involvement, and then we'll be back with some time for questions and answers. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> Ken. Ken. <laughs> thank you, Paul. <laughs> Ken's not here. I don't know what, what that was. Um, hi, everyone. Again, I'm Becky. And before we get started talking about public involvement, I just want to make a quick um, announcement or two. While you're listening, if you have questions, go ahead and send your questions in. Um, you can listen to me and write, and that's totally fine. And then also, if you want a certificate of completion, make sure that you let me know, send me an email, and if you want your certificate mailed to you via paper mail, that's fine, just provide your address. And if you want it uh, just by email, that's also fine. In order to get your certificate, you do need to have completed all of the webinars. And so if there are ones that you need, make sure to just let me know. And if you've already contacted me, that's fine. You don't need to contact me again. So tonight we're going to talk about the Hanford Board. Cleanup isn't just determined by the agencies and the public. Uh, the Hanford Advisory Board and the Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board 
also provide advice and recommendations for cleanup action. So let's see. We'll start uh, with the Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board. We'll start at home. It was established in 1987 by the Oregon legislature, and it has about 20 members comprised of citizens, legislators, representatives from the governor's office, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, and two state, uh, two state agencies. Um, they meet three to four times a year, usually somewhere along the river. The meetings are two days long and are open to the public. The mission of the Oregon Hanford Clamp Board is to serve as the focal point for state government discussions of high-level radioactive waste disposal issues, to recommend state policy to the governor and legislature, and to make policy recommendations on Hanford-related issues. The Oregon Hanford Clamp Board's primary role is to make sure that Hanford cleanup decisions protect the Columbia River, and together, the Oregon Department of Energy and the board keep cleanup in the public eye and hold DOE accountable for cleanup. And it's important for the Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board to convey that the issues at Hanford aren't just important to Washington, they're important to Oregon and for the region. And there are multiple ways to get involved with the Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board. The first way is just by attending a meeting. You can attend any way you can find out the um, the meeting location on the, the Oregon Department of Energy's website, and meetings are open to the public. You can listen to updates from agencies and uh, organizations working in Washington on the site. You can also listen to members discuss their different viewpoints and come to conclusions. And also, you can make public comments while you're there. So if you're interested in the topic that they're talking about, that's great, but if you're interested in a different issue that's going on at Hanford, or maybe there's something that you'd like just to have on the record that you think about at Hanford, you can, you can do that there as well. If that's not enough, if you want to sit on the board, you have to wait until a seat opens, and then you can apply, and you would send your application to the, um, the governor's office. And if your packet matches the needs of the board, you would be appointed by the governor, and your participation would probably be in a public seat, and you would just contribute to the implementation of the mission of the board. So a little bit further away is the Hanford Advisory Board, and that was established in 1993 by the Tri-Party Agencies. There are 31 seats, and they're made up of members of the public, local and regional interests, environmental and business interests, worker and non-worker interests, and different government, governmental entities at all levels, including two state representatives from the state of Oregon. And each seat has an alternate. Meetings are usually held every other month in the Tri-Cities in Washington, and that's, those are full board meetings. And they're usually two business days long, but committees meet at various other times, either before full board meetings, after, or sometimes even on the phone. And there are five committees that you can observe, budgets and contracts, health, safety, and environmental protection, public involvement and communication, river and plateau, and tank waste committees. And the mission of the HAB is to provide informed advice and recommendations to DOE and its two regulators, the U.S. Uh, Protection Agency, Environmental Protection Agency, and the Washington Department of Ecology on selected major policy issues concerning Hanford, which includes a wide range of issues from cleanup standards and environmental restoration to risk assessment and management. An interesting point, uh, Paul mentioned that they uh, develop advice or they come to decisions by consensus, and that's true also for the Hanford Advisory Board. So it's a very important and unique fact about their decision making, and it um, offers a lot of really interesting opportunities for the public to observe and learn. Again, similar opportunities for involvement there. You can attend meetings, and that allows you to learn from the organizations that are there, what's going on, what challenges they're facing, that kind of thing, what, what kinds of successes they've had, 
And you can also observe the debate between members, which can be really important because it does represent a very wide range of interests. And you can observe how uh, agency advice, or excuse me, how they develop advice in a collaborative setting. If you like to take it a step further and sit on the board, you again wait until a seat comes available and then submit your application to the DOE. If you're chosen to be interviewed, a team of representatives from Ecology, DOE, and the Environmental Protection Agency will interview you. And sometimes it'll take a while to hear back because you have to go through a series of background checks and things like that. So uh, be aware of that. And then again, your participation would likely be on a public seat and you will contribute to the development of advice um, with the HAB. And so if you're interested in getting involved with the board and it feels like maybe you want to learn a little bit more information before you delve into that, you can look at the links that I've provided in the packet and they're, uh, they're the websites that contain the committee meeting summaries, both for the HAB full board meeting and the HAB committee meetings, and then the Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board meetings and agendas. So uh, they're a great way to learn a lot of information, understand the views uh, at Hanford, and so just a great opportunity to learn more. If you have any questions now, I see that we have a few. We will get to those right now. So give me just a minute here. So can you read that? Yeah. Okay. I, I was just going to say, I've got one question here. Before I start to answer that, I want to again just thank you for your interest in participation and, and encourage you that it's your term and turn to, to ask us some questions. And um, if you happen to have lingering questions from one of the previous presentations, um, feel free also to ask that. And I may or may not be able to answer it, but I'll give it my best shot. So. Okay, first question, are there any biological methods being tested that will help with cleanup, such as bacteria, that can consume radioactive materials and convert them into safer forms? Okay, good question. Um, ideally, let me, let me start. If you remember, I kind of talked about cleanup is, is getting hazardous materials out of the ground or immobilized. And this question, in a way, really speaks to that cleanup part of the process, not to NERDA. Um, in, in that, you know, that's where you'd like to see it happen. Um, DOE has done some limited work, not with radioactive materials, because there's really no way of converting those into something else except giving them time to decay. Uh, but they have looked at a couple of things, one of which is to use bacteria to try to convert carbon tetrachloride to begin to break that down to something that will decompose more quickly, um, using essentially putting an organic material in to, to stimulate growth of bacteria. Also, they've, they have looked at, um, with limited success, I, I think I have to say, again, using bacteria to try to um, stop, to, to, to address hexavalent chromium. Hexavalent chrome was, was used in massive amounts at Hanford at the reactors. Most of it went into the river and downstream and diluted into the ocean decades ago. But there were spills to the ground, there were leaks, there were pipelines that have continued to have chrome in, and so there are hexavalent chrome plumes at every one of the reactor areas and, and also some small chrome plumes in the central plateau. Hexavalent chromium is very mobile in the environment. It's very toxic. It's a carcinogen. A different chemical form of chromium, um, if you know your chemistry, um, it's a, a more reduced form of chrome, trivalent chrome, um, three electrons missing instead of six is much, much, much less soluble. And so what DOE has tried to do is to use bacteria to change the chemistry in the soil 
to create conditions that will turn hexavalent chrome into trivalent chrome. It will be removed from solution, and once it's there, it, it will only very, very slowly return to this to this hexavalent form. Uh, so that the idea is it would very much limit or pretty much stop um, the the toxic. You know, stop ha having it in concentrations that are toxic. Um, there's been limited success with that, but it is being attempted. It actually has been implemented and works pretty well at some other locations, but because of the soils at Hanford um, are, are very heterogeneous, it's very tough to implement that successfully at Hanford because it's hard to just get the material in the right place in the right amounts 100 feet down in the soil. Okay, second question. Is the river much shallower? As it flows past the reserve, as there is little or no dam influence, how deep is it at most as it flows through the area? Um, the, the Columbia River and Hanford Reach is actually an extremely diverse environment. There's places where it's flowing over, over riffles that are a few feet deep. Um, there's large areas where salmon spawn that are typically uh, 5 to 15 feet deep water with pretty fast current. There's also places in some of the channels and holes in the river where it's as much as 80 or 90 feet deep. Um, the Columbia is a, a, a big river here. Um, it's also a variable river. Because of operation of Priest Rapids Dam, the water level goes up and down, sometimes as much as 10 feet a day, um, comparable to tidal cycles you'd see at the Oregon coast, but it's it's caused by putting water out of the dams when hydro, hydroelectric power is being generated or not. Um, so water's deep in places, water's shallow in places, water's very fast moving in some places, it's, it's pretty sluggish in others. So it's a, it's a very heterogeneous system. Um, and, and I guess that's probably the, the best way I can say it. Have there been genetic effects on plants and animal populations within the Hanford areas? Uh, we really don't know. One of, the, one of the challenges with Hanford, and it's really a challenge that runs the whole way down the Columbia River, is that the highest, most of the high doses of, of uh, radioactive contamination were during Hanford operations 30 to 50 years ago. And so we don't have samples of plants or fish um, from that time that we can use as a benchmark to compare and see have there been changes. Um, it's a question. It's one of those ones, if you remember, the definition of injury was a measurable adverse change. And so unfortunately, it's something we probably won't look at in very much detail because identifying a change having to be able to prove that it's associated with releases of materials at Hanford, and then showing that it's detrimental are, are all tough challenges. So to the extent we go there, it'll be a pretty limited research program. The answer to your question is there's not much known. I'm not sure there's anything showing at the, at the environmental scale genetic effects from, from Hanford releases. OK. This was a fairly long question, so, so give me a second, and, and my old eyes are a bit blurry here. From an outsider's perspective, the vast tracts of land that are being devoted to preservation and conservation around Hanford seem like a convenient way for the DOE to essentially cover up the extent of contamination there. Visiting the Hanford Reach National Monument reinforced my sense that preservation works as a kind of greenwashing of the site. There are almost no visitor facilities there. There's little or no interpretation of the site's history. As an ecologist, you obviously support preservation, but do you ever feel like it's a little too convenient for the DOE to do cleanup and then just preserve the land? Wow. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a tough question. Um, let me, let me start by saying I think part of the reason 
that DOE has not done much in terms of visitor facilities or um, interpretive things on the site history is that certainly during plutonium production era, the site, including at times the river was, was off, and that whole buffer area around the perimeter of the site was off limits to the public for security reasons. Uh, subsequent to that, during cleanup, until a couple of years ago, there was still what's called special nuclear material, i.e. bomb weapons grade um, plutonium in particular, on the site. So security was, and in some cases still is, a very big deal. Access is still restricted um, on, on much of the site. The, the Air and Lands Ecology Lab is restricted access, but that's to that's for research purposes. Um, and so the intent there isn't simply to, to cover up or hide or, or paint a pretty face on it. Um, you know, greenwashing is a, is a kind of a strong word. There's times when we feel like um, Hanford cleanup is kind of skin deep, frankly, that they leave waste behind that's deeper in the soil or in the deep what we call the deep Vado zone, that area 20, 50, 200 feet down below the surface of the ground. Uh, and we have concerns about long term the, the um, extent to which that really will be protective. DOE believes that material will not move. I think they honestly believe that material will not move. Some of us are um, less sanguine that it's that it's isolated and will stay there forever. And forever really is the key word there because these are, are ways that will be with us for for thousands and millions of years. For plutonium, for instance, the half life is about twenty five thousand years. So decay during the next millennium will be trivial, negligible relative to the to the amount that's there. Um, so it's yeah, I, I, I support preservation of most of the site, but I also support good cleanup. And in part, that's because the better the cleanup, the less you have to worry about adverse effects in the future. And, and I should just mention that as part of CERCLA, uh, the law requires reviews at least every five years of, of remedies of the cleanup that's been done to see whether it's working or not. And if it's not working, then DOE, in this case, is responsible for going back and, and redoing it to make it work. So um, you know, how long that will actually continue to happen, the law says as long as it takes till the wastes are, are no longer dangerous. But as I said, that's a very long time. So. Um, there, there, there is a real question there. That's a, that's a, that's not an easy issue. This balance of of cost and the um, efficacy of of cleanup actions. These are great questions, by the way, all of them. Okay, considering the land use plans currently approved, seem to focus on preservation or conservation of the land, i.e., leaving the land alone for the most part to restore itself. What's keeping trustees and stakeholders from allowing the involved Native American tribes hold of the area? Um, I'll be honest and say I'm not the person who makes that decision. I don't know how those decisions are made. Uh, I know at least a couple of the tribes, in their mind, Hanford was theirs historically, and they would like to have it back. Um, I think the, the Department of Energy views this as being public land, and I think they want to keep it, for the most part, in public ownership, which would mean, as, as I talked about in, in talking about the National Monument, that it would be um, managed by somebody like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or eventually probably owned by those people. Um, 
Now, certainly the tribes have opportunities for input. I think the tribes talk to all of the federal agencies talk to the tribes. Um, there is a both informal and, and formal what's called consultation on issues that are contentious. And so, um, you know, I, I, it's while the tribes would like to to own and manage the land, or at least manage the land, I, I frankly, my guess, and it's just my guess, is that probably won't happen anytime soon. And I'm and I'm not going to put a, a judgment, a value judgment, one way or the other on that. I think that's just how it is. Okay, next question. Are there biologists studying the ecosystems in the Hanford cleanup area? How can someone be granted access if they want to study the ecological effects of contamination? Wonderful question. Um, yes, there, there is study that's been going on for a long time. Um, in fact, just to, to give you a suggestion, I mentioned the, the area, the uh, Arid Lands Ecology Lab, the, the Fitzner Eberhard Arid Lands Ecology Lab is, is actually named for two guys who were researchers with the Pacific Northwest Lab who were doing research on that facility and, and unfortunately were killed in a plane crash a couple of decades ago. Uh, there has been research on the site pretty consistently. Um, Pacific Northwest National Lab, which is owned by Battelle, um, has worked very closely with DOE for several decades. I can't say exactly when that relationship started. They continue to do research on the site. Uh, there's other research goes on with people from University of Washington. Washington State University. Um, there have been contracts with other universities, including Oregon State, in fact, in the last few years. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the process is for getting access to the site. Um, I know PNNL used to have summer students or graduate students who would do work there. I'm not sure financially where that program still is. Um, that's something I could I could ask next time I'm in Richland, or I'm sure if you picked up the phone and called uh, U.S. Department of Energy Richland Operations and, and asked for one of their public involvement people and said you were interested and, and asked a few questions, they could give you much better answers than I can to that. But I but I will say there is research by a variety of, of um, universities and, and others there. I'm not sure what all the opportunities are. Let's see. Will the land be released at DOE or NRC? Uh, will the land be released at DOE or NRC dose or, or DAC limits? for the public, or will it be released under EPA limits? Um, I'm not sure when and how land will be released. Okay. I, I think I'm not sure what DAC limits are. What the question is really asking is, at what level of contamination um, will the land be, be released, meaning opened up to, to public access where it's contaminated? I think that's what uh, the question is asking here. Um, I think there's there's two sets of things here. There, there's both numeric criteria. Those are mostly for water, so that it, for instance, says um, drinking water has to have less than eight picocuries per liter, for instance, of, of strontium-90 in it. Uh, when DOE is planning cleanup, they do what's called a risk-based assessment, where they look at concentrations in things like soil and water and model how that would move through biota, how human exposure would happen, both from contact and consumption of, of fish, for instance, um, or, or game animals in upland areas, um, to determine whether it is, it is that con the concentration at a site is safe 
or whether it should be cleaned up farther. The, the NRDA work will take a different look to see mostly for biota because if there's numeric standards, they're already being met in the cleanup. But we will look also at a similar kind of thing, looking not at human exposure, but at the injury, potential injury to the, the natural resources themselves. So will fish or beetles or great blue herons or, or any of those other animals you saw in the pictures I had be exposed to high enough concentrations that there's the chance of, of um, injury to those, either as individuals if they're a, a threatened or endangered species or to the populate at the population level for, for most species. And we don't know what those numbers will be until that work is done. In some cases, it will be the numeric standards that already exist. Um, there, there's no there's no one way that cleanup decisions are made or no one set of numbers that's used. I think probably the upper limit in any case, where a standard exists, like a drinking water standard, that's the highest concentration you would expect to, to encounter. And the, the belief is that those numbers are, are safe. I think we've run out of questions unless anybody has something. The last chance to get something in here, it's just about 8.30, which is when we're supposed to stop. Um, so unless something pops up here in the next few sections, I think we're going to bring this to an end. Um, and again, I want to just thank all of you for your, for your interest and your participation in this. Some great questions. Um, and uh, I, I urge you to continue your interest in, in these issues and in the Hanford site. And uh, have a good rest of your evening. And one last reminder, Ken Niles will be back next Wednesday night to talk about transportation issues, and hopefully you'll all be able to join us then. And with that, we'll say good night.